BlackRock has hit back at George Soros and his criticism of their growing business in China. Shares of BlackRock are up 28% this year. Last month, it recommended clients increase their exposure to China by up to three times. George Soros has called that strategy a tragic mistake, writing in the Wall Street Journal. BlackRock now says, through our investment activity, US-based asset managers and others have contributed to the economic interconnectedness of the world's two largest economies. Well, that's the point. Oliver Letwin's with me, the former British Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Minister. His book is China versus America, a warning. And if you listened, of course, to, um, to David Rubenstein a moment ago, China has threatened the US position as being the principal uh, economic power. So what is your warning, Oliver Letwin? My warning is that on the current trajectory... Uh, the Chinese determination to be the other great power in the world and the U.S. determination to remain the sole leader of the world is heading us towards a uh, Cold War and that there are so many flashpoints around the world, which I describe in the book, that we could easily see over the next uh, two or three decades a Cold War turning into a hot war, which I think is a disaster we ought to avoid. Right. Now, Donald Trump put sanctions on or tariffs on. Uh, Joe Biden hasn't lifted those tariffs. So to some extent, the trade relationship remains frozen, which leaves, say, for example, the EU as another major trading block of uncertainty there and the UK pretty much out on its own. Yes. I mean, the, the, the real worry here is not the, the, the trade war, which uh, is... Um, something that, that uh, could be cured. Uh, it, it's a deeper problem that uh, because of this, there's this struggle for hegemony over the world. Uh, and because of these flashpoints, um, the relationship is getting more and more tense, going way beyond just trade and way beyond just trade and investment into the whole question of how we deal with one another and how we right. uh, manage the world. And I, I, I believe the only way out of that, actually, the, the, the current vortex, is for the US and China to begin to cooperate effectively in areas of common interest, which aren't the controversial items, not the, China, South, the South China Sea or the East China Sea or the Himalayas or somewhere like that where there's a flashpoint, but rather things like climate change and global financial stability and global health protection, where we could actually be doing business with the Chinese, however much we disapprove of some of their actions and values. That's, and by doing that business, we could build up trust. That is desirable but unrealistic, I suggest, bearing in mind the current state of, of, of play. And, and I'm thinking of Hong Kong and the new law in Hong Kong. I'm thinking about the flashpoint of Taiwan, which inevitably is going to become far more fractious in the years ahead. How do you build that bridge? Well, I don't think it is unrealistic to build it if we focus on areas where there is actually common interest. So it, in the very near future, in the next few weeks, there is going to be COP26 and an effort to uh, deal with climate change. Now, we all know that it's impossible in today's world to have any serious impact on climate change unless the US and China are working together right. on it. I believe they could actually do that, notwithstanding all the problems you're alluding to. Similarly, we just had a massive pandemic. We all know that the WHO system is broken. It is possible for the US and China to cooperate in a narrow band to put together some much more effective system of global health protection, even if they're disagreeing about Taiwan, the South China Sea, and many other things besides. So it's a question of picking right. the issues where we could build trust. Oliver, forgive me if I take you down a British uh, political story. Um, which obviously I, we're not necessarily interested necessarily in the in the minutiae of the social care policies of uh, uh, of the government in the UK at the moment. But I am interested as a as a, poli as a full politician yourself on your view on the, the idea of breaking the manifesto pledge. In the case of Boris Johnson, there were two of them: one about pensions and two about raising taxes. Listen to how the Prime Minister of the UK justified breaking his promise. No Conservative government, no Conservative government, Mr Speaker, ever wants to raise taxes. And I will be honest with the House, I accept, yes, I accept that this breaks a manifesto commitment, which is not something 
which is not something I do lightly, but a global pandemic was in no one's manifesto, Mr. Speaker. What do you make of it? I mean, it does it. Is it, it sounds reasonable, but does it add fuel to the fire that politicians don't keep their word? Well, it obviously does. But on the other hand, actually, I don't think that's the real problem about the policy announcements that's been made. I think the real problem is it doesn't address the real issue, which is looking after the elderly. It addresses instead the question of protecting the inheritance of the children of people who are well off and have property to protect. Uh, but if you, if you leave aside that question, just ask the question, as a matter of fact, if the public believes that the policy is worth pursuing, uh, will it forgive the government for breaking a manifesto promise under circumstances where hundreds of billions of pounds of money have had to be printed and where the fiscal situation is very tight? Uh, and I think the answer is very probably the public will actually forgive that. Oliver Letwin, thank you, sir. Your book, China versus America, a warning. is a fascinating read. I'm grateful you came to on the programme today.